Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 26. And I gave the Bible study today a title in the form of a question. And the question is this. Are you sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit? Because if you haven't already, it's important to recognize how we can easily come to God with our whole lives figured out and planned out. And we come to God with our plans. We've already figured out. We already know how we want it to to end. We know how we want it to happen. We have a few ideas of how to make things happen. And we bring that to God. We formulate it in a conversation with God. And we kind of tell God what to do. And it's not entirely bad. I mean, I think it's, we've got something in our hearts and our desires. But you can't come to God with things figured out. The Bible says that God's ways are not our ways in Isaiah 55. And we need to come and pray according to God's will. We want to be able to say, God, what you have for us is what we want. It reminded me of the time, one of the episodes in the life of the children of Israel under the leadership of Joshua, where they're coming into the land and they experience great victory over the city of Jericho in a very unusual way. And then after the victory, they go into the city of Ai, the very next city as they're conquering the land, and they experience great defeat. And the big difference between the two is, coming into Jericho, they were deep in prayer, receiving their plans from God. Coming into Ai, they thought they had it all figured out. And the problem with Ai is that people lost their lives. And there was great defeat. A man planned his way without seeking God. Would you turn over to Proverbs, hold your place in Acts, and turn to Proverbs with me. I want you to see these verses. In Proverbs, let's start in verse 16. So Proverbs are right after the Psalms. And it, again, this great encouraging proverb, a piece of wisdom for us. Proverbs 16, notice with me in verse 9. The Bible already speaks to this attitude that we can have, followers of God. We can have this. It says, a man's heart, Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And how many times have our plans been changed by the Lord? Where he has taken and interrupted what we thought would happen, how we wanted it to happen, and he changed our ways. And even so, as you think of this passage, a, man plans, a man's heart plans his ways, so many stop with the first part of that verse. They stop with their plans. I mean, after all, we're reading the Bible. After all, we're praying. After all, we consider ourselves good Christians. So, you know, let's just plan our ways. It's not sin. It's not rebellion. But as we're making our plans, we have to look for the direction of the Lord. Because it's just possible. It's very possible that your plans are not the ways of the Lord. As good as they might be. And we, have, we make a great failure when God directs our steps, but we stick to our plans. We make a great failure when God directs our steps in a different way than our plans, and it ends in disaster. You know, we can have the best plans in the world, but if they're not from God, you can expect defeat and difficulty and discouragement. Let me show you another proverb in Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 21. Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 21. 21. And by the way, if you choose, you know, as you're reading the Bible and praying every day, if you choose as part of your reading plan to read one chapter of the Proverbs every day, there's 31 chapters, this is the kind of wisdom that will be sown into your heart. You won't memorize every single verse and you won't remember everything that you read, but you're depositing wisdom into your heart so the Holy Spirit can bring it back. And this is a great wisdom scripture in verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. So there's a lot of things going on in our minds and our hearts, but it's God's counsel that's unmovable. Let me give you another one, chapter 14 in the Proverbs. This is very common. Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 12. Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 12. Listen to this carefully, church. There is a way that seems right to a man but the end is the way of death. 
And there are ways in our lives we just think this is the way we should go, but the end is going to be death. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and what? He will direct your path. So I ask you again, are you sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit? We drop in, coming back to Acts chapter 8 now, we drop into a time by way of review of excitement, and difficulty mixed in the early church. We're in the early years of the church's birth and life and formation. And you remember in Acts chapter one, Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem, the spirit of God will come upon you, you will be my witnesses. And where did he say? He gave the location. He said, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which surrounds Jerusalem, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the will of God for the church. But up to chapter six and seven, the church basically stayed in Jerusalem. And they became in some ways comfortable. They weren't necessarily in any kind of rank of rebellion or just massive disobedience, but they also weren't like on fire in obedience either. They stayed in Jerusalem when they were very clearly told that the ministry would go beyond Jerusalem. But they stayed. And so you can find, and this is something interesting, like you can be doing the right thing and still have more, God still have more for you. You don't have to be in a massive place of rebellion for God to turn your life around. He can turn your life around when you're doing something well, when you're on the way obeying God. And that's where the early church is. So what happened? Stephen, Stephen, the, the person that was serving the widows, he had this occasion to stand before the religious rulers. They lied about him. They, they made false accusations against him. He defended them with one of the most articulate, clear presentations of the history of Israel and the gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing to the resurrection of Jesus. And what did they do? They killed him. They murdered him. That was his reward. And in that, we are introduced to a man who was watching it all, Saul. And it was through Saul, through his persecution of the church, that God stirred up their comfort and ease. As they were settling down, God wanting them to rise up. And he allowed the persecution to come. And he allowed Stephen to be stoned. And he allowed Saul to come against the church. He allowed it to happen, and he used it. Remember, anything God allows, God uses. Nothing is wasted. And sometimes God will give us this gentle little push to get us going, to move us forward. Sometimes it's gentle, sometimes it's dramatic. And so part of the persecution sent, one of the results of the persecution, we learn Philip was sent to Samaria. And he was faithful, ministering to a people group that was an outcast, considered well beyond the gospel in the eyes of the Jew, but not in the eyes of God. God had a plan for Samaria, and he sent Philip to Samaria. And you know what the gospel did? It broke out in revival. The Samaritans embraced the gospel because God loved the Samaritans, and God was using Philip, so much so that there was even this fake believer We learn his name. We learn, we met him last time. His name is Simon. He was a fake believer, a make believer. And God uses Peter with the gift of discernment to to bring that out. And now, with that in mind, come to verse 26. Our attention now in chapter 8 is back to Philip in the midst of revival. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And that will be the focus of our time today. Those simple truths in the life of Philip. The first thing I want you to notice in his life is that he is a great example of a yielded vessel. He is yielded to the will of God. Philip is just open. 
If we were to put words to what yielded means and what it means to be open to God, we would probably use words like this. You, you, probably on the lips of Philip and his family and his prayers would be something like, you know what, God, whatever you have for me, I'm open. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will say whatever you want me to say. I will do whatever you want me to do. I'm open. I'm not married to anything on this earth. I'm married to you. I am your bride, Jesus. And I just want what you want in my life. I'll go to a place you don't want me to go. I'll do things that make me uncomfortable. I'll do things that may, are unfamiliar to me, whatever it is. And so Philip goes to the area of Samaria and there's a revival. And in the middle of this revival, in the middle of such great things, comes this angel with a message. And the message to Philip is, get up and leave this revival. It's time to go. Now I want you to stand back for a second and just consider how hard these words must have been to hear in the midst of something wonderful and great in the midst of like, this is what I was born for. This is what I want. I want to see cities transformed. I want to see lives change. I want to see families saved. I want to see deliverance and power and signs and wonders. And in the very middle of that, the answer was, it's time to get up and go. And what made it harder, or what could have made it harder, is he wasn't given the whole story. He wasn't told what he was going to. He wasn't told everything that unfolds. We're reading the Bible, you know, you have, to dis, you have to step back and pause as you're reading the Bible sometimes because we know what's going to happen. He's going to meet this Ethiopian eunuch. He's going to get saved. He's going to, like, we know how it happens, but like, Philip has no idea. What do you mean leave? And you want me to go where? From Samaria to Gaza? Now, we haven't talked about this in a while because it's been a while since we've been in chapter one, but remember, the book of Acts was written by Luke to a man named Theophilus. And I think this is a little insight that remember that Luke is writing to someone, not only to Theophilus then, but to us now, that where he is being called to was another place of isolation and aloneness. And he just wants you to know, hey, by the way, I'm calling you to the desert. He was sent to the desert. From a place of revival, you know, we often use desert as a time of barrenness, a time of emptiness. We, we, he doesn't know where. I mean, he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. All he knows is he's been given direction and he has to leave to the south to the desert. This old Gaza, this old Philistine city, referring to the deepest, darkest desert. Now, Philip's faithfulness, you know, what's happening here? What, why would God... Why would God call someone out of a great, wonderful time in Samaria, especially to a place where nobody wanted to go to? Philip went there and great revival broke out. Why would God do that? I believe this is an example of God testing his faithfulness. Testing his faithfulness. If I was delivering this Bible study to a group of pastors and elders, church planters, I, I would remind them that along the way, their call to ministry is going to be tested. Their call to ministry will be tested, like Philip here. He's in the midst of revival. It's everything you would want to see. And it's like God saying, are you willing to leave all of this for nothing? Are you willing to lay all this down for me? Just to step out on my voice. Did, did you think that the step of faith would be just to move somewhere and never leave? Or did you think the step of faith would just to be settled down, comfort and ease, never take steps of faith again? Or, or how about this? Will you serve one, or even at this point, he doesn't even know, are you willing to serve zero? Just, just me. Just, if you just know me, is that enough for you? As you would to be in the middle of revival. Are you willing to serve when nobody sees you? Nobody knows you? Are you willing to follow me even when things look and sound absurd? You know, if I was teaching pastors here, this is where all kinds of church growth methods and seminars and, you know, guys are just so caught up in the external instead of just knowing God. God will take care of his church. And I think, I know you're not pastors or elders, but listen, as you follow Jesus, God will take care of the things in your life. It's not so important. I think with pastors, I tell, like, it's not so important, like, that people know your name. 
Like there, there's a big difference between people knowing your name. Now, understand this. It's inevitable. People are going to know your name. If you introduce yourself to someone, they're going to know your name. If you teach the Bible to more than a couple people, they're going to know your name. So knowing your name is not the issue. There's a difference between people knowing your name and, and this. And this is a very clear distinction. There's a difference between people knowing your name and you wanting people to know your name. There's a big difference between the two. And that's a big heart issue. Because I'm telling you right now, the Bible is clear. God will share his glory with no man. And God will share his glory with no woman and no child. No, I mean, as silly as it sounds, I don't even know why I need to say this, but I will. No one is greater than Jesus Christ. And nobody cares. Nobody should care about the vessels that God chooses to use. All glory and honor and power belong to Jesus. And there's a big difference. And don't think it just happens to pastors. Don't think it just happens to teachers and Bible teachers. It's like, I want people to know my name. I want, no, no, it, it doesn't matter. Your name will come and go. But the name of Jesus Christ saves souls, changes lives. And so maybe it's just a heart check for you and for me today. Yeah, of course people are going to know your name. Of course you're going to communicate yourself with your name. Yes, yes, yes. But is it because you really want people to know your name? You're just going to find the fickleness of people will discourage you very quickly. And people forget your name. And people come and go. But the name of the Lord stands. And here, Philip, I don't know what test is happening. There could be a lot of different ways. But it was a big call. This was a big call in Philip's life. And I don't want you just to associate this call, being open, sensitive, and open to the Holy Spirit. I don't want you just to associate it like to moving to another place. Then you'll miss the whole point of the passage. This was the call of faith for Philip. That it was his. This was God working in his life to move, you know, fulfilling Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This can be lived out in a lot of different ways. It may not be a call to move to a different physical location. It could just be a call to move into some kind of practical Christian service. It could be a call to move across the street and talk to your neighbor. It could be a call to move to talk to your coworker or your boss. It could be a call to move to extend forgiveness. It could be a million different things. But when you receive the call to arise and go, you have no other choice than to do what he does here in verse 27. You need to arise and go. He arose and went. Now, I hope you like to write in your Bibles. You should buy highlighters, different colors. We have them downstairs. You can get them different places. I hope you write in your Bibles. Write however you do on your app or on your phone. But next to verse 27, don't miss this. This is foundational in the health and the vitality and the power of the church of any generation. And it's these two words, immediate obedience. You don't have a verse in between. You don't have a verse in between of Philip hearing and considering. Instead, the Bible's clear that he heard and obeyed. Because I've found over time, it's very easy to talk myself out of obedience. It's very easy to rationalize away great steps of faith. And before you know it, you have talked yourself out of great things. <laughs> God has said, go, you heard him right the first time. And then over time, it just completely is in a place where you no longer want to obey. And then it passes, then it passes, then it passes, then it passes, then it passes. And you just don't want that for your life. Immediate obedience. And the difficulty, of course, is that he wasn't given the whole picture. He wasn't given every step. God's will comes one step at a time. Not three steps at a time, not five steps at a time, not a hundred steps at a time. God's will comes one step at a time. Hearing God here in this message from the angel, he was just given, you know, in this case, he was given one step and then the direction to go, but he doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what to look for. He doesn't know anything except it's time to go. 
And this is the direction I want you to go. That's all he has. God's step comes, God's will comes one step at a time. I would go so far to say that there isn't a second step until you take the first. There is no second step. Well, okay, okay, if I do this, then what will happen here? And then what will happen here? And what about that? And how about this? None of those are going to be answered until you take the first step. That's something to be discovered. The life of faith is a life of discovery. Well, well, you know, Ed, I won't take these big steps of faith until I understand. You won't get understanding until you take the step of faith. Are you with me? Amen, church. Hello. Anybody with me today? You're not going to get full understanding. Then you would be living life by understanding. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, if God would just explain it to me, well, then you'd be living life A life by explanation. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, if God will just give me everything, what's it going to look like in five years? Well, then you'd be living by your five-year plan. The Bible says that we live by faith. And faith requires you not to know everything. Then it wouldn't be faith. If you knew everything, then it wouldn't be faith. You wouldn't have anything to trust God for. 